All right, welcome everybody. Come in. Apologies for the slight delay. We figured out a couple of tech uh, glitches and smoothed those out, so we're all ready to go. I hope you are all um, kicking back, relaxing, hopefully with lunch if it's lunchtime where you are, or maybe a coffee or a nice drink. Um, super excited for today's Great, yes, Hannah, super excited for today's conversation. Um, and another episode of Co-opting AI. I am Mona Sloan. I am a sociologist of artificial intelligence. I have been hosting the Co-opting AI series since 2019. I'm an assistant professor of data science and media studies at the University of Virginia and also a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU where I was before. Now, today's show is about an often overlooked but hugely prominent intersection between AI and society, and that is athletics. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by a brilliant co-moderator who also happens to be a UVA alumna and a former elite athlete, Rebecca Jarrett. Thank you, Mona. I love to be called brilliant. Um, hello, hello, everybody. Like Mona said, I'm Rebecca Jarrett. I'm a former student athlete, also a former youth national team player, and now I'm a PR professional. I'm really excited to be here and kind of help moderate this conversation. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for being here. Um, also, heartfelt word of thanks to the Co-opting AI supporters, namely the Karsh Institute of Democracy at UVA and the NYU Institute for Public Knowledge. Thank you to faculty and, of course, importantly, staff for helping the series be such a success for such a long time. Now, before we begin, I want to underline that here at UVA, we acknowledge that the land that we learn and work on is the homeland of the traditional territory of the Monacan Indian Nation. We pay respect to the elders and acknowledge and, and knowledge keepers past and present. And we acknowledge and pay respect to the enslaved Africans, enslaved laborers and free black laborers who built UVA as well as their descendants. And today we acknowledge the land, we acknowledge labor traditions and knowledge and we acknowledge lives. Now, today we'll be talking about um, innovation, about technology, about bodies and the global economy of sports and different kinds of data-driven technologies and AI systems, ranging from motion capture technologies to various forms of predictive analytics are everywhere in sports, not just profession professional sports. They range from performance prediction and optimization to injury risk reduction, data-driven decision-making in sports marketing and entertainment, and all kinds of digital activities in sports arenas. Athletes, whether pro or quote-unquote just on the college level, are constantly tracked, um, which, by the way, is different, um, as I've learned for people who menstruate and people who do not menstruate, since um, there is training planning happening around the menstrual cycle, for example. Wearable devices like watches and heart rate monitors track the player's whereabouts on but also off the field, um, and they promise to improve players' health, fitness, and safety. And of course, this shores up questions around labor, surveillance, and data rights, not just sports in and of itself. Rebecca. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And I, I'd love to highlight those things just a little more from the athlete perspective, like I said, I played at UVA and also the national team. So I attended my first youth national team camp when I was 14. Then I committed to play soccer at UVA when I was probably 15 or 16. I had competed in multiple international events and FIFA events, including an under 20s World Cup cycle, which was amazing by the time I was 21. So I had a lot of experience pretty young with elite athletics. Um, so this kind of ongoing and very early exposure to these kinds of things gave me a really interesting vantage point to see not only the rising prevalence, but also increased sophistication of these kinds of devices on the sort of US soccer end of the spectrum, which is a lot more sophisticated than, you know, my club team that I was playing for when I was 14 or 15 years old, introduced me to a ton of things 
both manual and also those more digital things. So things like readiness, we would do every day, submit sort of a survey to monitor how we're doing, how we were feeling, things like that. But I also had to wear a heart rate monitor, a GPS monitor. I wore player maker devices, which go over your shoes that track the most crazy, minute little details. So I got to see the really sort of high end of that type of monitoring, um, but it also ranged to more personal things, more injury prevention things. I suffered two ACL tears, so I had two major surgeries. So I got to see sort of the road to recovery and how these devices are used in those sort of capacities. So like Mona said, there's a lot of interrelated parts here from safety, health, fitness, but also there are questions about data rights, um, privacy, things like that. So I like to say I have a nice vantage point as not only someone that was surveilled, but also in this type of environment, being able to help um, sort of just be a part of this kind of conversation. So I'll let Mona continue. Thank you, Rebecca. And, you know, this uh, is not really breaking news. You know, these kind of things have developed over a longer period of time, as our guests will show us. Um, however, it is also big business, as I've just learned. So the global sports technology market size was valued at 13, uh, around $13 billion last year, but it is expected to grow at a 20% uh, rate annually until 2023. Now, what we want to do today with our wonderful guests is to look under the hood of athletics and AI. And really what we're after is trying to understand how data-driven technologies and AI intersect with different aspects of athletics, highlighting both the athlete experience and points of views, but also discussing how the global economy of sports um, plays, and that's a pun intended, plays with AI. Of course, Rebecca is a terrific person to help us navigate that exploration, but I am incredibly pleased to have a wonderful panel with me today. Uh, George Atala, Hannah Bornstein, and Natalie Copperman. And kicking us off will be my colleague here at UVA, Natalie Copperman, who is an applied sports science researcher and a certified athletic trainer. She studies the use of biometrics, wearables, and other athlete monitoring methods to reduce injury risk and optimize athletic performance. She's currently an assistant professor at UVA School of Data Science, and before that, she was a PhD student in UVA's Department of Kinesiology, where she conducted research in the exercise and sport injury lab and athletics with the men's basketball teams and women's volleyball team. Before her doctoral studies, she spent several years at Northwestern University working clinically as an athletic trainer in athletics and the university health service. Natalie's research interests include data infrastructure and pipelines for collaboration in athlete monitoring, dynamic models of injury risk and athlete readiness, and creating seamless monitoring environments for teams and data governance in sports. Um, she has done terrific work with our men's basketball team, and you can find that online. Natalie has a PhD in education, kinesiology, and sports medicine, and a master of education in athletic training from UVA, and a BA in athletic training from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Natalie, thank you so much for being here. Now, following Natalie will be Hannah Bornstein, who is a collegiate assistant professor in the social sciences collegiate division and a Harper uh, Schmidt fellow in the Society of Fellows at the University of Chicago. Her research is broadly concerned with intersections of sports, race, gender, politics, and labor with a particular focus on long distance running in Ethiopia. Her book project, which is probably going to be called Running to Labor, Ethiopian Women Distance Runners in Networks of Capital, comes from more than two years of fieldwork in Ethiopia, along with multi-sided archival and anthropological research in the US, Europe, and Asia. Her research situates the stories of women runners within a global political economy of sport, as they navigate the world of corporate sponsorship, international competition, and gendered cultural expectations at home. Hannah earned a PhD in anthropology from Duke uh, with certificates in Afri uh, African and African-American studies and gender, sexuality, and feminist studies. 
and she is a very committed public scholar as well. Hello, Hannah. Thank you so much for being here. And then closing us off today will be George Tala, who is the Assistant Executive Director of External Affairs for the NFL Players Association. And he has served in this role since May 2009. So a, a good long while, George. Um, George manages the NFLPA's strategic communications, which includes media relations, crisis management, digital content, social media. Um, he helps uh, define the union's position in the lead up and during the NFL lockout, or, or did do that along with numerous other high profile issues and cases for nearly 15 years. So he knows all about these broad discussion and, and issues that we'll be discussing today. He's also had stints in financial services, nonprofit, international affairs, government, and politics. George was born in Lebanon and immigrated to New York City uh, shortly after birth due to the Civil War. Grew up in Queens, wonderful, um, and went to high school there and holds a bachelor's degree from Boston College in English and Philosophy. So fellow humanities uh, scholar, and he has an MBA from George Washington. You can find him online. So I've talked enough, but a few uh, items uh, about housekeeping. Our uh, wonderful panelists will provide their provocations, their insight, and then Rebecca will steer us through a hopefully vibrant panel discussion. Meanwhile, dear audience members, please put your questions into the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom right of your Zoom square. And we will bring these in as we flow through our conversation today. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for making the time. And Natalie, why don't you kick us off? Yes, and I'm starting my stop clock so that I don't go over. Let me share my screen. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here along with Hannah and George. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my research, my labs, and then I want to spend most of my time talking about the things I think about every day as I work through uh, this research. Uh, so what do I do? As I mentioned, most of my research is involved in athlete monitoring um, at the team sport level. Uh, the sport I work with the most here at UVA is the men's basketball team. Uh, so when we think about what does my lab look like for research, this is it. Um, our labs are wherever the athletes are, which tend to be uh, on the arena, in the arena, on the courts. Um, the picture uh, you see with the Virginia basketball in the background, this is their um, new weight room called the Good Stewards Applied Sports Science Lab. Um, this is the brainchild of their strength coach, Mike Curtis. And in this weight room, it is decked out with all kinds of instrumentation that allows us to track the athletes as they move through um, this space. And then we have other technologies that track the athletes as they're on the court, um, whether it's the practice court or in the arena. Um, so we don't have the traditional uh, gate labs. We try to put all of our work um, where the athletes are so they're seamless monitoring environments. Some of the instruments that I use to do this work, um, and Rebecca noted some of them that she has used through her journey as an athlete, are things like um, the catapult, which is a accelerometry sensor. It also does GPS if you're outside. Um, that sits in the back um, of the athletes. Uh, Often you'll hear after specifically soccer uh, national championships, like the men's teams will, you know, they celebrate, they're celebrating, they take off their shirt and people are like, why is the men's team wearing sports bras? And it's usually these harnesses that are holding some kind of a wearable device in them. Um, another one that we are, it's an emerging technology that we are using is the Aura Ring um, to track um, stress and sleep in our athletes. Um, the next ones are different camera type systems. Um, and this is something I'll talk about on the next page as this becomes a little bit more ubiquitous um, and athletes don't always know when these cameras are on or being tracked. And then lastly is um, uh, force plates. Um, these are embedded in the ground in multiple areas around the gym. Uh, athletes do a variety of movements for basketball. We mostly use jumps, um, which helps us get an indication of neuromuscular fatigue and that allows us to um, update training plans um, 
in real time to accommodate those fatigue measures. Um, and you can see in this middle picture here, um, these cameras are actually mounted around the ceiling. And you can see it's capturing, um, this is actually Mike Curtis, uh, capturing his skeleton as he goes through different movements. So we're able to get very accurate um, biomechanical angles uh, to look at how athletes are moving. Um, this picture is much fuzzier on this screen, um, but there is also this camera, this is called a perch. It's actually sitting up here. So it is able to track the barbell um, as they're lifting when they're in the weight racks doing different exercises. So that's a really fast overview of the technologies that I'm using in athlete monitoring with the men's basketball team. A lot of these technologies in some respect apply to a lot of other sports at UVA and at other colleges. Um, even if there's different, lots of different brands out there, a lot of the technology at its core is the same. So a lot of what I think about every day as I do this work um, is using data plus context to optimize athlete health, wellness, and readiness. And I say that as these technologies progress, and especially the way the these companies market this um, innovation is reducing athletes down to numbers. And I think that takes out a lot of the picture. And so how can we as researchers, as applied um, sports scientists really take the numbers because there's useful things in those numbers from the instrumentation, but then add context to make sure that we're never reducing the humans that we're working with to, to single numbers, um, even though that feels really smart and snazzy. It takes out a lot of um, the good parts of the research and context that can help us make better decisions. Uh, and then I think about how do we take all of this, these different data streams. So we capture um, roughly 13 different data streams on a single athlete in basketball. Um, and within those data streams, there's a lot of columns and rows. Uh, but then how do we take that? And like I said, add context around that and effectively communicate that with the athlete themselves, with coaches, with whatever end users there are, um, you know, to make decisions about um, injury prevention, about performance um, in a way that is more holistic than just looking at a single number. Um, then the next two are probably bigger bullets that take up a lot of my brain space right now, especially since Mona came on board at Data Science. Um, and one is uh, data privacy. Uh, how are we taking these data streams um, and ensuring that there's levels of privacy between um, what we're collecting on the athlete and coaching staffs or media or fans? Um, and how do we make sure that that data is never used against an athlete? Um, I think we've done a great job of putting these safeguards in um, at men's basketball here at UVA. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done to make this um, at an institutional level at the NCAA. So an institution being at each school. And I really hope that UVA can, as we work with UVA athletics more, I hope that we can be one of the first schools to really put out um, guidelines on how we're using athlete data and how we're ensuring the privacy um, of athletes when we collect this. Um, I will note quickly the the ordering that we talked about um, is really running up against uh, different state laws that I think um, we really need to have a broad conversation about and um, how we're using Aura data, which tracks highly sensitive data specifically for menstruating people. Um, and how we're protecting our athletes and the people who are collecting that data against any uh, laws within the specific states. Um, and then lastly is data governance. And I'm, I'm speaking mostly at the collegiate level. George can probably give us an hour long conversation about at the professional level around this stuff, but who owns this data is still a very large conversation that has not been um, really hashed out specifically at the collegiate level. Um, and I think it's really important to understand the provenance of the data. And at the end of the day, whose data is it? And then how does that play into privacy and how we share this data? Um, again, I could also talk for another hour about each of these bullets, um, but I will end it there. Um, Mona said, there's lots of information on my work with the men's basketball team and other UVA sports. 
Uh, there's a QR code for that um, here and we can share that out as needed. Um, but I will stop there and let the next person go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Natalie. Hannah, that's your cue. You're muted. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, I think that's a good transition because I'm 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 sort of interested on the other side of uh what Natalie is talking about and kind of the the cultural um um conversations around how people are feeling about data. And and I think where you work um as a data scientist, you know, you're very close to the athletes, but in my context, it's kind of it's quite different. Um, I'm an anthropologist, as, as was stated. Um, I, I work with Ethiopian runners and kind of how they move from the the countryside to the city, um, seeking sponsorship. Because I'm an anthropologist, I'm essentially contractually obligated to start with a vignette. So I'll just do a very quick one, which is um, to say that I was at the 2018 World Championships in Finland, in, and uh, I was watching athletes run. And the Ethiopian national coach said, turned to me and said, um, of an athlete, she's not being economical. She won't win. And he was referring to a running economy in this instance, which is a sports science term that measures running efficiency and um, is a really present kind of way of talking about the athletics market and labor more generally, as I've seen, especially in the last couple of years. So I've also heard agents uh, express the potential of market value through the terms of running economy, saying things like, this athlete has an incredible motor. Her running economy must be off the charts. Um, running economy is a term that's used in sports science, usually uh, attributed to Jack Daniels in 1985, who defined it as the rate of oxygen consumption related to a particular velocity of running. Broadly, I think when people talk about running economy, they talk about it in terms of saying how efficient is this athlete and kind of how, how much potential do they have. So I use this term because it was something that I found have circulated a lot um, in the last few years doing my research. And I kind of want to like reframe the question of running economy as something that is much bigger. So in my context, working with women runners from Ethiopia, of course, you have to be an extremely good runner to be, to be successful in the sport globally. But I'm kind of arguing that running economy requires a lot of other things. It's, it's gendered, it's racialized, it's socially complex. Um, we need to think about things more about how good you are on a treadmill to have good running economy. Um, so that for women is being able to navigate a male dominated running world in which pursuing running is kind of complicated if you come from certain countrysides. It means being able to find uh, partners that can help you along the way as you move to the city, which is can be a really fraught transition, leaving people in precarious positions, um, managing expectations of still having children. Um, so also tracking menstruation on kind of like their own terms in different kinds of ways and um, searching for contracts that are not exploitative, um, weighing the pros and cons of, of migration. So when I was at this competition in Finland that I mentioned, I had been at the competition in Ethiopia in 2018, a few, like about a month prior, and I saw these junior athletes who really were, were, were about to potentially change their lives in really radical ways. Um, in Ethiopia, um, there has always been this kind of question about shoes and athletes often talk about getting access to shoes and shoe and, and just stable footwear as something that's that's really difficult. And so here they were looking to get shoe contracts. So be signed by mostly Adidas and Nike. Those are the two main companies that work in Ethiopia. And to even get a base $10,000, $20,000 contract would really transform the lives of runners and also give them a steady stream of um, what's called Yasport Mazaria and Amharic, which is like sports materials so clothes shoes etc which are which are difficult to come by um athletes often talk about not having these as major impediments into being competitive they view it as an, a global advantage where in the west it's much easier to get these things people that run have net have networks and, and capital they can get these things in ethiopia it's much more difficult so anthropologically it's kind of interesting because while shoes are really important they also elicit a lot of um, different kinds of context. So athletes, um, they really value shoes. They talk about them as being authentic and real. They worry that they're getting poorer qualities of shoes. Um, but also witchcraft can be involved with shoes. So if you give someone a pair of shoes and then as, as a gift from someone in your training group and they do poorly, sometimes you might be accused of, of something called metat, which is kind of like stealing their energy from them. 
Um, so while conversations about shoes have always been there since I've been going to Ethiopia since 2013, in uh, 2017, the conversation radically shifted in ways that some folks here might be familiar with, specifically with the uh, introduction of these new, what are called super shoes, which is we're kind of in the era of these super shoes where there, there was a Nike introduced this new Vaporfly. This is an early-ish iteration with a carbon fiber plate that goes through the middle and this foam cushioning. Um, but who helped bring value to these shoes aside from Nike footwear technology developers who are obviously important, um, African athletes. So in 2017, um, there was an attempt to break two in the men's marathon, which many people know, I'm sure has happened now with Eli Kipchoge here in the middle on the upper left, but uh, Ethiopia's Elisa de Sisa on the upper left and Eritrea's Zersenai Tedese were also chosen for this uh, attempt. This, this, these are some stills from a National Geographic documentary. And the documentary goes into some of the specifications that were laid out for the attempt. So on the bottom left, you can see it was on this racetrack in Italy. They had professional pacemakers, this um, vehicle, which kind of did some wind buffering to better shield the athletes from the wind with, with the time clock. Um, but in this film, the sports scientists also talk from the Nike lab about how they chose the athletes. So some of them had really impressive resumes, but the others were also chosen on this kind of testing that they did on treadmills with measuring, you know, economy, oxygen uptake, et cetera. And they talk over and over that these athletes have incredible running economy, right? That's, that's the term that they use. It's really important for potential. Um, there's a lot of literature that goes into sort of the history of how running, something like running economy came into being. I, I trace all of this in the book. Um, but I think what's worthwhile worth mentioning just briefly is that the language of running economy in part comes from this industrial work physiology in the late 19th century um, when Europe was industrializing and looking to create workers that would be less less fatigued, right? So the idea was that idleness was the sin against industry and they wanted to kind of make people as efficient as possible. So early sports medicine also coincided with some of these studies of work physiology, because of course there's the belief, right? And the, and the truth that athletes would serve as ideal participants to help researchers understand the greatest forms of human potential. So this invention by a French physiologist, Etienne Jules Marie, um, designed new apparatuses for measuring human walking and running. And these were brought to the 1896 modern Olympic games to, to start collecting data essentially on athletes. I think what's really important, especially in the context of my research, is that these studies are kind of coinciding with an age of colonization when conceptions of black and brown bodies are seen as more pain resistant, durable, and better suited for certain activities. Um, and colonial ethnologists are writing about bodies carrying a hardness and the ability to draw an interstate of relaxation coming from like a lack of advanced intellect. So who gets monitored, how they get monitored, et cetera, there's this kind of like racialized, really important political economy, uh, political history um, that I think we, we we should talk about a little bit more as these new technologies continue to be developed in new ways. Um, and so the shoes were important for a lot of reasons, not only because the athletes that were chosen to wear them that brought value to them had good running economy, but they were also said to give good running economy back to runners. They were supposed to make your running economy better. So within Ethiopia, this meant that athletes really needed the shoes to even get a chance to run well, to then make money, to, to continue pursuing and pushing the sport forward. Um, so where I see, oh, and here you can kind of see some of these new um, ways that the shoes are, are seen as um, valuable and integral and also kind of not giving credit to the athletes work and labor. There's really like, oh, the shoes are doing all this work. And, and, and I think that's problematic. Um, so where AI coming is coming in here as I see it and something that's kind of developing and emerging, I'm an anthropologist, so I also love the word emerging, um, is where uh, machine learning is kind of taking these metrics which again have this really long history um, to do things like gait analysis um, and make kind of recommendations as to how you should, you know, better your gait analysis um, and train to reduce injury. And I and I, I want to stress that Ethiopian athletes are really interested in using these technologies, but they're not often being kind of talked to and to go and with about um, how how their bodies are being measured. So 
I wrote this article, if anyone's interested, where I talk a lot about um, watches and data tracking, where there are Nike and other kind and Garmin are are doing studies with Ethiopian athletes that I've seen where they put watches and like sweatbands on these runners in Ethiopia and their data is transferred to these labs in the US. Whereas where Natalie's working, again, like you're very close to your athletes in a lot of instances, that's not the case in, in my context, right? And when I, you talk to the athletes, they actually don't really know what's happening with a lot of their data. Um, I know I just have like 30 more seconds, but I, I'll just briefly say, so I, I have a Garmin, it's making, it's giving me recommendations about how I should train. Um, I'm seeing new things about AI endurance, kind of online AI coaching platforms telling you how you should feel, um, what to, how to train. There's not a lot of conversation about kind of what about other things going on in people's lives that are informing this data, at least from my participants, the kind of cultural considerations. Um, and so I'll leave it there and kind of, cause I, I think I'm at time, but, um, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to kind of introduce this idea. Thank you so much, Hannah. Much, much appreciated. And if you could stop screen share and then uh, George, over to you. Appreciate it. Such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you very much, Hannah and Natalie. Very thought provoking. And uh, I don't have slides today. I have more provocations in four areas that I wanted to share with you. Uh, first, a little bit about ourselves. We are the labor union that represents all NFL players which means all of the things that Hannah and Natalie are talking about and also impacted Rebecca and her experience, we try to get a handle on and govern to the best of our ability to protect the players. Um, we have been in existence since 1956 and the challenges that we have are not unlike other labor unions. And a lot of you have seen AI take uh, center stage in some of the recent labor disputes with SAG-AFTRA and the writer strikes and how that technology is um, encroaching on the actual jobs and livelihoods of people, right? So we look at this in really four areas that I wanted to sort of provoke people on. Uh, first is the natural labor one. Um, we have challenges to who owns the data, how teams collect the data, what they do with the data, will they use the data against the players? And that's not just um, speed and performance and strength, but that also in the NFL means a lot around injuries and health, right? So um, we know from the data that we do have that the average career is slightly more than four years. Well, what if teams were able to predict that a player was going to play only two years based off of their health um, information that they gathered? Or the other way around, what if they withheld information to the players um, around a longevity of a certain player, right? So those are areas that we um, have a lot of challenges around related to the livelihood, literally in the job uh, functions of our, of our membership. The second one is around performance and how teams use uh, data that they collect around performance and, and measuring success for players, right? Um, for those of you who watch the NFL, you know that Tyreek Hill, for example, they're tracking him in game, how fast he runs. He ran 22.1 miles per hour in the middle of a game this year. Okay, does that mean that um, from a performance standpoint, he's performing at a higher level than other players? How does that compare to the uh, other athletes, how does that impact their contracts? What does that mean for the viewing experience um, for for fans of the game and how you watch? And does that enhance the experience for uh, people associated with the sport or not? Third area is around competition. And this ties directly into some of the risks that we're seeing encroach, especially around gambling, right? So you, for those of you, again, who watch live sports, especially as is creeping into college now as well, you'll see during the game, okay, it's the, let's just take UVA since Natalie, you're a basketball person and I am too. I love watching hoops. You'll see in the third quarter, uh, there'll be a, of a women's basketball game, there's a 64% chance that the team's gonna win based off of the score and the performance so far. In the NFL, you'll see, okay, if a coach decides to go for it on uh, fourth down, the analytics suggests that there's a 63% chance that they'll get this fourth down play 
Um, and so that that data and that analyzing of data is now starting to impact not just um, competition, in-game competition, but also big business. Mona, you mentioned it at the top, how much money is involved in this stuff, how people behave in terms of their, um, uh, you know, what they're spending money on. Are they placing bets? I mean, heck, we're having a Super Bowl in Las Vegas this year, right? So all of that gambling implication and, and fan behavior uh, implication to AI as well. Finally, this other area that I would label more on the ethical front, and this impacts our membership significantly, not just while they're playing, but post-career. Human health. How does their um, data that they collect while they're playing football translate to their human health beyond when they're playing? Um, we have seen, obviously, transformational information to our membership around how they, uh, what injuries they suffer while they're playing and how that impacts knee replacements, hip replacements, surgeries, post-career and the like. But we also see it appear in other studies around heart health and other things that don't necessarily show up um, on the injury report, so to speak, post-career. So is there a risk or an opportunity for the health data that's being collected and used while a person is performing their job to impact their behavior um, post-career when they're retired. And you see a lot of the health problems for athletes across all sports, not just football players, how that impacts them uh, in terms of, you know, potentially um, not just getting treatment, but what behaviors change and, and how can they get better supported? So those are the four uh, areas that we think a lot about. I have way more questions than I have answers. Uh, I am very, very glad to hear all these perspectives. I've been furiously taking notes to see what the next sort of frontier is at uh, with this space, but certainly, uh, oh, and a personal note, I, I started wearing a whoop strap myself, you know, not any sort of endorsement of the product, it's more like we have a partnership with them and we, um, from a personal level, like if I don't sleep well a certain day, I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what in my behavior um, uh, change that I was in the red this morning, right? So it also impacts, I think, how all of us who are even tangentially related to sports and athletics and health and performance are changing our behaviors based off of what the machines are telling us. So I'm very, very fascinated by um, the cultural phenomenon that is the uh, that is that is AI. I'll leave everybody with this and turn it over to questions uh, for the group. It's sort of an emotional touch point. We all watch live sports um, because it is it elicits an emotional response. So again, I'm a big NFL fan. Watch the games with, watch to see like you're going to see something different every week. Okay, uh, I'm also an Arsenal fan. I watched the matches yesterday. They scored in the 97th minute. Totally unpredictable. What if AI made the, the unpredictable predictable? How would that change the value of our emotional connection with sports and, and the actual tangible value of sports? So I uh, just wanted to leave everybody with that as, uh, as an avid sports fan, fan myself. Thank you so much, George, Natalie, uh, and Hannah. And Rebecca, I'm sure so much of this resonates with you as a former pro. So I'm so curious to hear the questions that you have for it, our panelists. It does, and it does resonate with me. And George saying he's an Arsenal fan resonates with me even more because both of my parents are from London. So they're like diehard gunners. So now me and George is my best friend here now. Uh, but I'll ask a broad question for all of you. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you see with implementation? I can start with uh, Natalie specifically. Where do you see the biggest roadblocks in terms of either performance or recovery on that side of things being so close to the athlete? Is your question around how like um, barriers to implementation of technology? Yes. Uh, I see this from two sides. From the athlete side, I would say the the biggest barriers are our culture um, and 
I think certain teams have a culture of either we have all opted in on this monitoring. Um, and I find that in those teams, technology has been used to the benefit of the athlete. And on the other side, you have um, teams where they the athletes have pushed back a lot on the use of technology to monitor them. And I think when you dig deeper, you find there some um, trust issues amongst uh, players and coaches or whoever else is interfacing with them in the data. Um, then at an, um, a broader level of implementation would be cost. Um, we see that the most advanced technologies and the people to come with the technology. So the context with the technology only happens at high levels. So either high levels of the NCAA or high levels of professional sports. So that would be the, the kind of the broader implementation issues. Great. Um... And I know your research, one of the things that you mentioned is that distance being Ethiopian women's data going back to US based labs. So are there inherent inherent challenges there when it comes to implementation or similar roadblocks that Natalie just spoke to? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, it's a great question. I I think the context is is so it's different and similar. Like it, it's different in the sense that um, in Ethiopian running, most athletes have very, very little education. Um, the system there is set up such that if you are a good athlete at a young age, you're kind of encouraged to actually leave school and basically pursue this as a full-time path in part because education in the sort of Ethiopian political economy guarantees you very, very little. Um, and sport is in some ways a much more viable and smarter option to pursue, or, or that's sort of the perception. I think the athletes are very smart. Um, there are some challenges in terms of communicating some of this this with them. But I think what happens a lot in these contexts is that they're just not even talked to or considered, right? Like, so you, when I was there uh, one time, I think I talk about this in the article, there was someone from a company who was working with an athlete because they were having a hard time syncing the data. And I was kind of, I'm not, I, I speak Amharic, so I was kind of helping to translate and um, she was very worried because she knows that's supposed to get to these labs where she's supposed to get some kind of benefit potentially. And then I kind of asked her just in my heart, like, oh, are you like interested in learning more about this? And she's like, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, but it's never even she's never really had the opportunity to actually have that conversation with someone. So there's like tremendous linguistic barriers. But I think oftentimes people assume that the the sort of level of nuance is something that the athletes like are not interested in or can't understand. And in my experience, spending time with athletes, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of them actually want, they want to use more science is what they would say. Um, but it's th there's not a lot of um, communication networks or effort to put into actually explaining what's happening with their data. And I do think a lot of them are also concerned with it, but again, they don't necessarily have an avenue to like voice that. Um, which is why I'm really happy that someone from a labor organization is here, because I think that's like extremely important and something that's lacking in the sport of running broadly. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, because I think one of the things that I observed in my own experience is there's a delicate balance between creating a seamless sort of monitoring environment. It's not practical for me to be wearing like a heavy backpack in a soccer game for tracking, for, you know, like those types of things. There's some value in sort of making these things more invisible. But then there's another question of sort of I want to know what's going on. So there's a delicate balance between this sort of seamlessness, but also visibility and understanding on the athlete side. So sort of playing that balancing game, I don't know if maybe George, you could speak to this the best, but how do we, or how do you imagine a future where things are seamless and practical and able to, you know, integrate into the sporting environment, but also maintain the sort of education, visibility and protect the privacy of the athlete, but also keep them informed of, you know, what's being tracked, where's it going, who gets to know what, what do I get to know, where do I draw my boundaries, things like that. Yeah, I I'll, I think the technology is always ahead of the governance. That's just the case in most, most parts of anything that we talk about. The technology is always going to race against the, the rights and the governance and the, and the, you know, the parameters around how to use it. What it, that, that's why we had candidly, that's one of the big reasons why there was a strike recently, right? Because the technology got way ahead of the governance around it. Um, and I think that's, you know, we're not there yet, I don't think, in professional sports. But um, again, for those labor unions who have taken this issue seriously, like us, we've taken data rights very, very seriously. 
Natalie, you mentioned a crucial word around trust. We want to take trust out of it. The, the athletes, in our view, should have equal, if not full control of their data rights because it impacts their um, earning potential, their their wages, and, and it's a it's a question of really control, right? So, Rebecca, you mentioned at the top um, your experience when you were training how they were trying to get um, information around menstrual cycles. Well, well why, right? Because they're going to take you off the field or they're going to make decisions that impact your um, career that are related to your personal health information. So the, the question around control, I think, is, is really uh, central to this discussion because it, who has control ultimately is able to make decisions um, that are either ethical and responsible or not, right? And unfortunately, in the, you know, my experience with this, most of the onus, and Hannah, you mentioned labor unions, most of the onus falls on the athletes to band together to, to do that. Otherwise, they'll just get run over because the industry and the money is just too much. Yeah, I was going to ask, I'm glad you just included with that, but either in the professional realm, sort of things like player advocacy, collective bargaining, those types of things, or in the college and NIL, um, those types of sort of moments, how do you see either these big aggregators of data, AI, new technology, things like that, transforming this sort of ability for players to either advocate for themselves, brand their interventions that this kind of data can make to help the player, not in terms of performance or injury, but in terms of selling themselves or getting more out of their experience, either in college or in the professional NFL level? Uh, I think it's I think it's more of a risk than it is an opportunity right now, right now, um, candidly, because we've seen, you know, the technology is just faster than the governance. So imagine like the, the fear that we've got on a professional level is all of the gaming industry right now is based off of revenue going to the athletes being, paying, at least in our case, every NFL player gets a royalty fee for their name, image, and likeness being in the Madden game, for example, right? Um, are there developers out there who have access to player photographs across the internet and can develop, you know, rogue games based off of, you know, not paying the athletes for their name, image, and likeness? It's a risk, right? So I think individual athletes have the potential to take advantage of the technology, but the collective, it's its a bigger risk to the collective than it is an opportunity right now. Natalie, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add from the collegiate, at least your lens from the collegiate standpoint. Yeah, um, I've been waiting for the day when an athlete walks into my office and asks me my thoughts on giving data outside of UVA. Um, and we still have a governance issue. We don't even, we haven't really decided who owns that data. Um, but I would strongly advise against any athlete um, giving data away for money at this point. Um, we just have no idea what can and would be, would be done with it. Um, and I would, I would always hate to see an athlete, you know, um, come up against harm to either themselves or their futures because of that at this point. Got it. So from kind of both of you seem to be in the mind of advising players in a certain way. So all three of you, how would you advise coaches, trainers, or I guess other stakeholders that are viewing this data to be mindful? I know Natalie you mentioned the value of context, and that's something that I realized in my time that having the right trainers and the right staff viewing the information can really change the experience. So how in your specific sort of focus areas, what advice would you give those sorts of facilitators? to either increase context, have the right people advocate for, you know, labor or the, right, the proper sort of environment? What are those sort of key bits that you'd like to pass on to whoever is monitoring or sort of facilitating the data environment? I, I can start. Um, I Whenever we talk to coaches about this, um, we always say that the information we put in front of you should be a, a conversation starter don't make decisions off of the report that we put in front of you. But if you have concerns about somebody's readiness, if we flag them as fatigued, don't jump to, oh, well, well I'm not going to put them in the game today. It's a conversation about 
hey, what's going on in your life right now? You know, is there something we can help you with? How are we helping our athletes be the best student athletes they can be? We're NCAA student athletes. Um, how can we assist you in your life, in your academic and your athletic pursuits? Um, and so we, I con we constantly try to talk about the conversation around the information they're given. In my work, we have a lot of safeguards on who gets what reports and what data. And the word trainer is a little ambiguous. We have strength coaches who are not HIPAA um, employees, but then we also have athletic trainers who are HIPAA employees. So they get a different level of data and obviously are well, you know, they collect that data um, where the strength coaches, you know, have the same guard, sa safeguards as like the sport coaches would. And so those conversations look very different depending on, you know, the level of data, you know, data clearance. That sounds very um, government official, but like data clearance you have um, within your, your role. Yeah, I go back to just to quickly dovetail on that. I go back to trust. There has to be a trust between the athlete and the coach slash administrator that you're using the data to help the player as opposed to using it against them. And there's that very, very fine line between um, working with somebody you trust and um, knowing that, oh my gosh, I got an injury. It's going to take me eight months to recover and the predictive data on this specific injury says I'm never going to be the same. Right. I mean, that's an oversimplistic way of looking at it, but that, that person is going to use that information against me in the next contract negotiation. So I think there's that very, very, very fine line, which is why as a, candidly as a labor union, we try to take the trust out of it. Like let's put controls in place that don't even raise that trust um, question there. I mean, one thing I, I might add to the conversation is as someone who's not like a total expert in this area is, is as someone who falls running specifically and um, Natalie, like you might have more to say about this, but I know with like um, menstruation, for example, um, there was a lot of science coming out saying like, you should train around your menstrual cycle. You should, or like I was reading articles about this for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden they were kind of like, well, actually maybe it doesn't matter as much as we thought it did. Um, and so I think another part of the conversation also needs to be the fact that like the latest breaking sports science data that comes out. I mean, we, I think we all know that like collecting data on athletes is kind of difficult because um, or, or making sort of claims is difficult, not collecting data because there's just not that many people competing at a super high level and training at a super high level. So whenever we like think we have a trend, I think we also have to remember that a lot of times that trend reverses <laughs> in a year from now. So to make sort of claims, whether it's a, you know, the, the sort of like labor ones on contracts and things like that, but also even training recommendations. I mean, um, you know, there's a, there's a conversation about body and health and just like life longevity that I think we have to like constantly be, be bringing back into the conversation as well. I would love to chime in on the menstruation piece. Um, there's a lot of that. You said, like you said, there was a ton of research for a while that, that came out and it was all correlation, not causation. I have yet to see a causation article come out that said being in this part of your menstrual cycle correlates to this kind of injury, this kind of training. And so, yes, it shouldn't have even been in a conversation. I think it was pretty low. And then I believe it was Hope Solo gave a interview in which she was tracking her menstrual cycle and training around it. And I feel like then it just blew out of the water in a way that nobody could get their, their hands around within the strength and conditioning field. And so, yes, I think the media does a great job of taking those things and it tends to just really expand faster than we can understand. Um, so yes, and we see this in all kinds of research. There's all kinds of correlation research out there, but until we have great causation research, we need to stick to you know, the things we actually do know work um, that don't require anyone to track their menstrual cycle or give away very private information like that. Yeah, I think um, Hannah's point about scale is very important from my vantage point. I think I'm inherently a little bit biased and skewed having played for national teams and at a school like Virginia where there's money and access and the right people to be viewing information. So I definitely overestimate how much is really out there. Um, but 
That's a very important point. I know, Mona, I believe you had a question that you want to ask as well. Yeah, so we're talking so much about <clears throat> data collection and sort of almost data harvesting, right? And sort of questions that have been around, you know, with that for a long time, consent. You know, we talk about this in research all the time. That's something we're trying to sort of teach our data science students now, and we're talking about it a lot. I'm curious to hear all of your thoughts on um, the AI part of that. So how we're using that to train models, especially predictive models and um, innovation. And specifically, I'm interested in how in your field, um, you know, whether that is with athletes or as you know, researchers who are, or or experts who are looking at the object of the innovation, how do you sort of see that? What kinds of AI innovations are you seeing, and how are they sitting with athlete interests or not? If you could sort of be a, a little like, explicit about that, maybe Hannah, we'll we'll go with you first, and then George, and then Natalie. Yeah, I think this is something that um, I'm still, I'm, it's actually like a kind of a newer interest of mine, especially because in my time, I've been going to Ethiopia for a little bit over uh, 10 years, and there used to no, be no smartwatches in Ethiopia, and that was like a huge development. Um, I am on a running like sub elite team. I'm also like, we're, we get Garmin watches, and I, it, gets, it started to give me recommendations sometimes based on my data. Or like um, it, it translates to training peaks, which is like a training platform that my coach uses. And sometimes it will tell me you know, my like threshold values. And I find them to be extremely inaccurate, um, both based on how I'm feeling and then based on how I'm able to perform. So part of this is like personal, but I guess my concern is that the data that I don't, I don't know, like I haven't been able to start tracking, like I'd like to sort of interview some of these, these groups that are how they're creating these plans, because if they're using data from athletes and giving that to and recommending platforms, and again, these are kind of profit generating companies. Um, that's why I mentioned AI endurance, these like online coaching platforms, um, if that ends up both going to athletes, professional, semi-professional, but also the general public, um, I, I, I'm concerned that these are not good recommendations. Um, you know, and, and, and a lot of this, to be honest, is, is embodied, but I talk about it with, with runners, like, oh, it's telling me my stress is high. It's telling me like, I need 72 hours of recovery. That's not how I'm actually feeling though. So I, you know, the, and, and that's what people are saying. So, um, and then other times it's telling me I need two hours of recovery and I feel like I need to sleep for four days. So, um, I think that we also just like to Natalie's point, um, need to like really take a lot of what's these recommendations that are that our watches and devices are giving us with a huge grain of salt and get some more education as to like what we should actually do um or what athletes should actually do when they receive these recommendations and i think i mentioned um the biggest area that we're seeing it creep into the viewing experience maybe not as much as a playing experience is around predictive outcomes right so again team has 50 percent chance to win the game at the start of the game based off of how the trend of the game is going and other other measures then you're going to have um you know at some point in the third quarter that'll increase to 80 percent, right and so everybody's watching to see is the unpredictable going to happen uh so i think we're seeing it creep in the the ai predictive stuff um, frankly, for those of you who watch Thursday Night Football on Amazon, you've seen that they've introduced some of that um, Amazon analytics into the into the broadcast, right? Well, what's analytics? It's really just data crunching and predictive information, right? That they're trying to that they're trying to push out. And I think the other area that we haven't quite um, tapped into yet that we're trying to get our hands on, and somebody used the word emerging uh, earlier in the in the show, I'll say. Um, is around gambling. And if you can start predicting, um, if AI can start crunching large competitive data into what play is going to be run, right? Because now you can pretty much bet on every single play. Um, how does that, how is that going to impact that particular industry? Uh, millions of dollars being moved back and forth. What are the regulations around that? 
who controls the information. I mean, ESPN has a sports book now, right? So how you're, how all of that sort of blends in together could be a very, um, could be a very dangerous uh, uh, venture that we're heading into. Um, my first, my first thoughts were very similar to what Hannah mentioned, the, these proprietary algorithms that are running on all of these devices. Hannah mentioned the Garmin, George has mentioned his Whoop, I wear an Aura ring. Every day we get these like single numbers um, and there's no explainable AI attached to those. We're just seeing the number. We don't necessarily know how it's made. Um, but the, uh, another one I've, I've, I've seen to add a new one to the mix is in uh, drafting or recruiting um, athletes and what information is going into these algorithms to decide who teams are um, going to be drafting or or signing. Um, and that information is often taken from athletes on, on visits or without their knowledge and put into algorithms and we're not really sure how that's made and how that's gonna affect their, um, their trajectory of their careers. Um, we see at the NCAA, the NCAA teams are collecting data and doing this, but also we have, you know, the pro teams calling the NCAA teams asking for this data to put into their algorithms. So, uh, and pretty soon, if the camera technology keeps emerging, we'll be able to harvest a lot of that without any athlete realizing it's being harvested on them. So, um, all things that are interesting when you are interested in the mathematics of it all, scary when you're interested in the privacy and ethics of it all. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you all for answering my questions. I will kick it back to Mona to facilitate some more audience Q&A. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Yeah, we've got plenty of audience questions and feel free, uh, free to pop in more. Um, I'm going to start um, um, or stay with you, Natalie, and the student athletes, actually. Um, and Mary has a question um, and asks, do the student athletes consent to have their bio data monitored and al analyzed in any way? So is there any sort of formal consent mm -hmm. process or informal consent process um, currently in, in place? Uh, blank, blanket across student athlete, NCAA student athletes? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, for uh, the data I work with personally, if I'm working with that data, I've made sure that the athletes have um, consented in front of me in writing um, on the data that we're collecting, and they have the right to revoke that data at any time um, and have not be tracked. Um, and they can either come to me or we have a, another safe, they can work around me or around the basketball staff to have that done so that there's no, they never have to feel there's like a direct conflict there. Um, and it's been very clearly stated that tracking or not will not affect um, your position on the team. Um, the, we have a high level of trust within the teams I work with, um, or I, I feel that way. <laughs> um, and so we've never had anyone do that, um, revoke their data before. Um, but I try to be very transparent. Um, and any athlete at any time is welcome to walk in and talk to us about their data. And I would be very happy to tell them exactly what we're doing and how we're tracking it. Um, the athletes I work with mostly just want the want the coaches to you need to look at the data and then give them instructions and directions from there. Um, but no, at the high level of NCAA, there is not any type of consenting. Thank you for that, Natalie. And that's really interesting, this, especially this last bit that you said with sort of um, basically expecting, rightfully so, the coach or the trainer to interpret the recommendations that are given and then translating those into sort of a training plan, right? There, So this is almost like a distributed interpretation and decision-making process that is sort of mm -hmm. happening where multiple people and machines are sort of involved in, which is really interesting. Um, so thank you so much mm -hmm. for that. Um, Hannah, I have one for you from, from Matt. Um, and you spoke about recommendation prediction um, and sort of also the issues with that, right? The, the wearable saying one thing, you feel another, and sort of there's a clash that's happening. Um, can you share your perspective on how data and I 
uh, or data and AI use impacts how different ways of knowing are prioritized around bodies, around the sport, the industry, the global economy of sports, as you put it, Hannah. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's a huge question um, and a very anthropological one, I think, as well. I think anthropologists love the ideas of thinking about knowing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, this kind of idea of positivism is, is a bit, con even even with the, the question of the consent is kind of interesting, too, because I think with athletes in particular, um, I mean, it's it's certainly kind of scary that they're actually like literally not consenting in a lot of ways, but even when they are consenting, a lot of it feels like coercion rather than consent. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to like flag that. Um, and then in the, in my case, I think that um, I think that it's it's tricky because I think that athletes, first of all, in the sport of running, I, I think this is true in every sport too. Um, your body because of doping and doping controls, like you have to give blood samples. That's like part of the institution of sport. So your body is kind of like an open, um, your biometrics are sort of, you have to share them to be a part of the, of the system. Right. Um, and so your body in a sort of kind of way for athletes can be seen as something that needs to be in the public domain um and that in and of itself especially for like ethiopian athletes is is already a different form of knowing right and that kind of institutional organization has you know european problematic roots and so i think it's it's a similar situation here um with ai um Again, this is kind of an emerging interest, but I guess one thing I will say is that the double, the other side of the coin is that a lot of the athletes feel like it's an untapped uh, potential that will help them. And um, again, in a situation where there is no CBA, there is no union, there is always the threat of scarcity of um, opportunity. So runners are keen to take advantage of their earning potential um, during that period of time. Um, and they don't, they, because they don't have certain protections that something like a labor union might provide or, or a certain sense of collective voice. So it's really tricky, but if you know that you only have five years of your career, there sometimes is a sense that like, oh, the science has not actually, we haven't been able to take advantage of it in the same way that people in the West have. So we actually like, should get that. We want that as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not really answering your question other than to say that I think that there is a there is a drive for science, and but but what that actually looks like is a black box for a lot of people that I work with. Thank you, Hannah, and I did appreciate actually genuinely the black box metaphor here because it it is you know gives body to that metaphor um, in an important way. George, um, you know when I hear uh, all about AI data and sports and all of your great contributions today, you know, Rebecca's lived experience and insights. I cannot help but think about how, um, you know, professional athletes are really at the fore of labor, data, and AI issues. In other words, I can't help but wonder if the um, conditions and and um, opportunities and issues that professional athletes are experiencing are foreshadowing what is already happening in parts, but what is going to happen to all kinds of workers and laborers, i.e. to all of us moving forward. And so I am um, going to use that as a backdrop for the next question um, and bring in um, my post question, which is around uh, monitoring uh, the monitoring of unintended consequences as a result. In other words, uh, we're monitoring everybody, right? But are we also monitoring unintended consequences? And how is an organization like the NFL Players Association thinking about that? It sounded like you are sort of on your way to sort of map out maybe a strategic way of off, off addressing that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, George, on that. Yeah, we we start with rights, really, is where we're... I mean, as a labor union, that's the only place where we can think to start is how do we protect the athletes' rights? And that, with, for this discussion, is around data privacy, primarily. 
And if there's going to be um, a shared information of any kind around individual player data or athlete data or worker data, um, let's make sure that there's governance around who controls it, how it can be used, how it can't be used, and have that conversation continue to evolve. We don't have all the answers yet, but at least if we have certain principles around, um, you know, again, fundamental rights of the athletes, then at least we can start to shape certain governance around it. I'll give you an extreme example. I was just thinking about as I heard all of you talk about the stuff. We all wear some wearable of some kind that gives us some data, right? Imagine if your employer, let's create a crazy scenario. You didn't get great sleep last night. Your employer has access to that data. You go into work, you, whatever your job is, whatever your job is the next day, your employer tracks up, you know, uh, Professor Sloan only had uh, 23% sleep uh, success yesterday. That means she's tired. I'm going to give this assignment that I was going to give to her to somebody else, right? So just just crazy example, but that's what, if you're a professional athlete and you're in the red zone, you're not going to, and, and the employer uses that against you, you might not be with the starting team on that day and another athlete might get that chance, which impacts the way you're compensated, right? So those are, those are ways that we're trying to think about it is like, what are the rights? How can you make sure that the data helps the athletes and what governance, again, to repeat myself, what governance and controls can we put in place? Thank you for that, George. And I appreciate that um, being sort of a very focused approach, right? Like a, a very concrete next step. My last question is from Alan McFarlane, who is a dear friend at NYU for you, Rebecca. And Alan is asking about the fun. Is any of this measuring a business any fun for the athletes? My short answer is no. <laughs> um, but, but I think, again, I might be a little biased coming from an environment where there was a lot of access to a ton of different things and a very high level of sophistication. But I think the thing that was interesting and exciting and fun to us was the new gadget. And I know that, again, there's a lot more that layers into that. But like I said, I, I had two pretty major injuries and two major surgeries. And a part of my recovery process was heavily aided by a lot of the data that was collected on me the years prior. So I played eBay for five years. So I had a nice log of information. And one of the like really exciting might not be the right word, but cool things for me in that process was they were able to give me sort of targets that were reasonable, but also stretched based on sort of my previous performance. So I had like my athletic trainer would give me these like fun challenges that he set up that were like, I don't know how to explain this in the most simple terms, but basically he was using this, all of the data that he had collected in the previous years to design and like excite my rehab process because nine months of knee rehab is very boring and very uninteresting. So he was able to sprinkle in some like fun little challenges and fun little things that wasn't necessarily making the rehab fun, but it added some flavor to the experience. That's the first thing that comes to mind. But again, my short answer is no, there is no fun measurement, unfortunately. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Okay, last round, because we're already a little over time. Each of you, one sentence answer, please. AI and athletic athletics, what's the future? Natalie, Hannah, George, please. Um. It's, this is taking too long. Um, data governance. I think that we're either going to see major uh, lawsuits or we're going to get a better handle on it quickly because I think that it's all going to come to a head very soon. Uh, I would say athletes need to organize. <laughs> I would say I can help you with that, but also... I'm going to be Mr. Brightside here and say the uh, future of AI and athletics uh, could potentially mean better long-term health for athletes. Thank you so much for those. Um, and I would agree there is so much that we can uh, work on, uh, talk about, achieve together these sort of questions at the intersection of 
AI and sports really open up broader questions around participation, decision making, technology, labor, all these kind of things. And we're having these conversations now much more decidedly as we maybe had them a couple of years ago. So I'm excited about that. A massive thanks to Natalie Kupperman, Hannah Bornstein, George Atala, and Rebecca Jarrett um, for your wonderful contributions today. All of these folks are online. You can find them. Their work. Hannah's book coming out. Natalie is here doing amazing things. Uh, and George is all over the news all the time. And Rebecca's in New York. So um, you'll be able to find them. There are a bunch of uh, more thoughtful questions from audience members. I encourage these audience members to reach out to our panelists um, with those uh, with those thoughts. This is the last Coping AI for 2023. We're closing up shop until next year. We will be back with um, Coopting AI math big topic and we have an election year next year so we will also talk about AI and political campaigning in the spring. I hope to see you all again. Huge thanks, big gratitude to everyone, wonderful panelists, audience members, IPK and Karsh. Thank you and I will all see you next year. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.